Let me begin by unequivocally stating, from the Bible, that Israel, as a nation, not only rejected Jesus as their Messiah, they persist in rejecting him to this very day. John 1, 10, 14 declares he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, but full of grace and truth. When Jesus came, he proved his messianic role by healing the sick, restoring hearing to the deaf, enabling the paralyzed to walk, cleansing lepers, and even raising the dead. Despite these miracles occurring in front of Jewish leaders, why did they still reject Jesus as the Messiah? This is what we will discuss in today's video. Before we continue, please support us by liking this video, subscribing to the Timeless Bible Tales channel, and turning on notifications so YouTube will alert you whenever we upload a new video. May you receive abundant blessings from the Lord. Amen. Let's begin. To understand why the Jews rejected Jesus as their Messiah, we must consider the political and religious context at the time of his first coming. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, the Jewish nation was under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. Although their leaders studied the Old Testament and awaited their Messiah, they focused solely on prophecies regarding the Messiah's glory, ignoring those foretelling his suffering and death. They expected the Messiah to redeem Israel from Roman domination, not realizing he came to redeem all humanity from the curse of sin and death. Their focus on a conquering king led them to overlook prophecies of a suffering servant. Thus, there was a messianic expectation that the Messiah would liberate Israel from Roman oppression, establish a worldly kingdom where Jews would reign with him. Clearly, Jesus did not fulfill this in his first coming, but will do so in his second. With this background, let's discuss a few expectations they had for the Messiah. First, they anticipated the Messiah to restore Israel's kingdom. Scriptures like Joel 3.1.17 speak of the Messiah purifying the world of evil, and Psalms 2.6.9 describe him ruling with an iron scepter. Isaiah 2.4 prophecies the Messiah bringing peace so profound that people will no longer train for war. Even Jesus' apostles wondered if he would fulfill these prophecies before his ascension. In Acts 1, after his resurrection, they asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This shows they expected the Messiah to free Israel from Roman oppression and establish a worldly kingdom. They did not grasp that Jesus came to inaugurate a different kind of kingdom, a spiritual one. Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near emphasizing spiritual rather than physical blessings. Not only did they expect the Messiah to restore Israel, but also to renew its spiritual life, as prophesied in Jeremiah 31 about the new covenant with new hearts. The temple was central to this experience, yet Jesus predicted its destruction. Thus, Jews concluded, this man cannot be the Messiah. Jews largely rejected Jesus as the Messiah because they deemed him blasphemous. Central to Jewish faith is the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5 here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. This prayer, learned from childhood, emphasizes the oneness of God. Then Jesus came, claiming worship, service, and love due only to God. They couldn't reconcile this with their monotheistic belief that Yahweh alone is God. Jesus' declarations, like before Abraham was born, I am asserted his eternal existence and divine identity, which they saw as blasphemous. They understood I am as Yahweh's name, indicating Jesus' claim divinity, prompting them to stone him for blasphemy. Further, when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he was perceived as claiming equality with God, again seen as blasphemy. The Jews' response, attempting to stone him, reflects this. Therefore, the second reason for their rejection was that they considered him a blasphemous imposter. Secondly, the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah because this notion did not align with their theology. The belief that Jesus is God, the Son of God, or a person within the Christian Trinity is incompatible with Jewish theology. In Jewish theology, the Messiah is expected to be an ordinary person, born of human parents. Moreover, the Messiah is anticipated to be mortal and will eventually die, leaving his kingdom to his son or successor. According to Jewish tradition, the Messiah is believed to be a direct descendant of King David. As stated in Isaiah 11:1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. 
For the Jews, the Messiah is envisioned as an unparalleled political leader and genius, the wisest person ever. He is expected to use his extraordinary talents to lead a global revolution that brings perfect social justice, inspiring everyone to serve God with utmost devotion. These exceptional qualities are described in Isaiah 11:2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. The Messiah will surpass all others in these virtues, capable of discerning truth and sincerity in a world filled with deceit. His ability to perceive human spirituality will enable him to understand their spiritual history and identify their sins. Jews also reject the Christian belief in the virgin birth and the supernatural conception or incarnation of the Messiah as presented in the Gospels. Is the Jewish interpretation of the Messiah correct? Consider the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 30 to 35. The angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end, Mary asked the angel. How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Christians believe that Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine, as evidenced in the Bible. Two points need consideration. First, Son of the Most High signifies not only the Son of God, but also one bearing the mark of divinity. This phrase in Hebrew means He is the Son of the Most High. Psalm 2-7 states, I will proclaim the Lord's decree, He said to me, You are my Son today, I have become your Father. No one can deny that this psalm has messianic implications, referring to the Lord's anointed. This proclamation affirms Jesus as the Son of God, emphasizing His divine origin. The author of Hebrews cites this passage in Hebrews 1.5 as evidence of Jesus' divinity and superiority over angels. He received a name superior to the angels the Father never called any angel son, in this unique manner. This designation is reserved for the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. The concept of being begotten is crucial. Contrasting with created Jesus was not created but rather has created all things. Begotten describes a relationship between two entities of the same nature. Humans create objects of different natures. A man creates a statue but begets a child. Secondly, Jesus' physical lineage descends from David through Mary, qualifying him to sit on David's throne, symbolizing the messianic kingdom. Isaiah 7:14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Dear listeners, Jesus stands out as the promised Messiah not only because of his perfection as a human, but also because of his divine nature. Consider 1 Timothy 3.16 beyond all question. The mystery from which true godliness springs is great he appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Mystery, as Paul uses it, refers to a truth hidden in the Old Testament but revealed in the New. Godliness relates to the truths of salvation and righteousness in Christ, leading to holiness in believers. The manifestation of true and perfect godliness is in Jesus Christ. God was manifested in the flesh refers to Jesus, especially his incarnation. True godliness was first revealed in the flesh when the Savior was born as a child in a manger in Bethlehem. Another critical aspect according to Jewish theology is the absolute oneness and indivisibility of God. In Judaism, the concept of a triune God or any division within God is considered heretical and akin to polytheism. Jewish belief holds that the Torah rejects the notion of a triune God, as expressed in Deuteronomy 6.4 here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one according to Judaism, any individual claiming to be God, a part of God, or the true Son of God is regarded as blasphemous. The Jerusalem Talmud clearly states that if anyone claims to be God, they are lying. In A History of the Jews, Paul Johnson explains that the division between Jews and Christians stems from differing views on the nature of Jesus. While Christians assert that Jesus is both God and man, Jews do not share this belief. Jews regard the Christian worship of Jesus as idolatry because they see him as entirely human. The verse in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is correctly interpreted by Orthodox Jews to affirm that God is the one true God, distinct from the many gods worshipped by other nations. Therefore, one body speaks to a complete unity, forming a singular whole. 
This is why the doctrine of the Trinity, far from negating monotheism, actually affirms it. The New Testament revelation provides greater clarity on this issue. In John 10, 30, 31, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The Jews immediately picked up stones to stone him. In their minds, there was no doubt about what Jesus meant. They recognized his clear claim to divinity, prompting them to stone him. Now, let's consider the Jewish perspective on the Messiah. In Judaism, the image of the Messiah differs significantly from that in Christianity. According to Orthodox Jewish belief, the Messiah's role is to bring about the Messianic Age, a singular event. A supposed Messiah who is killed before completing this task is not considered the true Messiah. Maimonides asserted that if the Messiah does not complete all his tasks or is killed, he cannot be the Messiah promised in the Torah. Maimonides states if he does not succeed in all these matters or is killed, he is not the Messiah promised by the Torah, and the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel about the Messiah will still be fulfilled. According to Isaiah, the Messiah will be a descendant of King David and is expected to bring the Jews back to their homeland, rebuild the temple, rule as king, and usher in an era of peace where knowledge of God fills the earth, leading nations to acknowledge their wrongs against Israel. Ezekiel says the Messiah will redeem the Jews. The Jewish view of Jesus is influenced by his living during the Second Temple period rather than during the Jewish exile. Jesus did not reign as a king nor bring about an era of peace or great understanding. He died without fulfilling the messianic tasks, promising a second coming. Judaism holds that Christian claims about Jesus as the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible are based on misinterpretations. According to this view, Jesus did not fulfill any of the Jewish Messiah's requirements. Was Jesus' crucifixion a failure as the Messiah? The messianic prophecies were not fulfilled in him. In Acts 1, 6, 7, the disciples asked Jesus after his resurrection and before his ascension, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, thus his kingdom would be one of love, not power. To achieve this, people need the Holy Spirit of Christ. The apostles still believed the earthly form of the messianic kingdom would be restored soon. They knew the prophecies in Ezekiel 26, and Joel 2 linked the coming kingdom with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as Jesus had promised. Could the messianic kingdom be established by force or politics? Removing sin and its power is essential before establishing this kingdom. Atonement rituals reveal much about the theology of redemption. The offerer had to place their hands on the sacrifice, symbolizing transferring their sins to the animal. They also had to personally slaughter the animal, showing that their sins deserved death. The priest then carefully handled the animal's blood to ensure the sacrifice's efficacy. New Testament believers see these rituals as foreshadowing Jesus Christ's death. However, Old Testament worshipers likely understood their offerings as atonement and the necessity of shedding blood for forgiveness. So what should we do as people from other nations do regarding how we pray for our Jewish friends? I will leave you with this. In Romans 10, 1, 4, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. I know they have a passion for God, but it is misplaced passion. When I visited Israel last November, I saw a people with passion, with longing, praying day and night at the Western Wall, reading their scriptures, the Old Testament, praying, worshiping. But as Paul said, they have a passion for God, but not based on knowledge of how God makes people righteous with him. They reject God's way of making themselves right with him by holding on to their own way under the law. Because Christ has accomplished the purpose for which the law was given, so everyone who believes in him can be made right with God. So how should our attitude be towards our Jewish friends? We should join with Paul in his heartfelt desire that all Israel will be saved. I mentioned earlier that there are two comings of Jesus Christ and that many prophecies about Christ were fulfilled in his first coming, but all the Old Testament prophecies about Christ that were not fulfilled in his first coming will eventually be fulfilled in his second coming, especially in Christ's thousand-year kingdom, where he will establish a kingdom on earth and draw all the Jewish people to himself, putting a new heart in them to desire to worship and follow him. But this is not the reality in the first coming these things will be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ, which has not yet occurred. Let me know your thoughts and feelings about the Jewish rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. Share in the comments below. May God bless and protect you. See you in the next video. Goodbye.